Big K52 Saturday morning meeting. Hey, I told you that we talk a little bit about five-year planning and how to get ready for 2018 as we close out this current year. And I really don't plan on being the whiteboard guy, but I wanted to put down some thought starters. When I was selling cars, I was always thinking about idle time. You know, what, you know, what, how should I invest my idle time? I mean, I certainly can make phone calls. I can call somebody up that I don't know, and I can go, hey, you think about getting a car or not, or yes, sir. And back when I started, back in the 80s, I mean, they made us call out of the phone book. I mean, if we, if we were idle, they would make us start in the phone book and just randomly call somebody at home. Um, I didn't think that was very efficient. Maybe you do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw a little bit of something at you right now. And over the next couple of weeks, as we close the year out, I'm going to just span on some of this stuff and how you get it going. Remember, an investment of time now will pay you in the future. Too many things in the car business are right now. Hey, listen, I go around the country and I do training, and I'll be right on the point where I'll help somebody make more money in their career if they'll make a couple of changes, but I can't get their head out of their phone. They're texting or they're doing something, or I'll go into a dealership and do training, and somebody will get up and leave the room <clears throat> for 30 minutes and come back, and, uh, and I go, did you sell it? And they go, no. So they gave 30 minutes away of their prep time that might have made them money in the future because they, they couldn't get away from the day. And I don't know if everybody really understands this, but think about this. is The car business either controls you or you control the car business. If you control the car business, then what happens is then your planning becomes better. Customers come in when you set times for them. Uh, F&I is prepared when the customer comes in and you start working on a schedule and you become more efficient and we've talked about efficiency this year. So let me just go through this real quick and I hope this makes a little sense to you and I'll broaden it over the next couple of weeks. So here's some of the things that I did. First of all, let's just say the average salesperson closed at 20%. And I, you know, I don't want to argue with anybody that's watching this. If you think you're a 50% closer, then my opinion is you need to talk to more people. If you're closing at 10%, then you, you're probably talking to the wrong people. So let's say everybody has a network in the dealership so that if you can't get the customer to say yes, then there's somebody behind you to come in to make the deal a little bit better, a closer or a manager or something. So we have, some, we have a net. So if the customer's there, we want to try to close as many as possible. But the average in the business is somewhere between 15 and 18%. I fudged that up to 20%. So I talked to 1,000 people this year. Doesn't matter how I talk to them, I can be standing on the point waiting for them to come up, but at the end of the year, I've talked to 1,000 people about a car. Some I got on paper, some I didn't get on paper, but out of that 1,000, I was a 20% closer, I sold 200 cars. Now, the way I see this is, I mean, I, congratulations, 200 cars, uh, you know, good year, that's over 15 cars a month, you did all right. But out of the 1,000, I sold 200, how did the 800 leave? I'm selling the number one brand in America. I'm selling the most dependable brand at the most affordable cost in America. Some of our vehicles come back and they're worth more than they were when they were new. So how is it that 800 people decided not to do business with my product or with me? So you guys work on that, but let's look at this. Out of the 800, if I'm a 20% closer, then I ought to be able to follow up throughout the year and bring another 160 of those people back. Because remember, of the thousand, somebody came in, they spent 10 minutes on the, at the dealership, they looked at a forerunner, and you didn't get a chance to do a walk around or demo drive. You really didn't even get a chance to per, uh, present the numbers to them. So I'm only looking at 20% of this 800 at 160. A couple of other things I might do. Join a civic organization. And I, I, don't, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I'm just begging you. I mean, if you, if you associate with the people in your town that have the most money, that actually control the civic part of the town, these people don't have time to come buy a car. They'll select a Cadillac or a Lexus or an Infiniti or a Mercedes or a BMW because they can basically pick up the phone and go, hey, I'm Dr. Nix and I'm uh, pretty busy right now. Um, I want to come back and pick up an XYZ high-end $100,000 car. Can you have it ready when I come in? And you know what? They'll have it ready when you come in. But you know, have somebody call a Toyota dealership and want to buy a $50,000 Tundra, and the manager turns right around, well, let, tell them to come in. If they can afford a $50,000 Tundra, they probably don't have time to come in and spend five hours with me. But then, you know, now I'm starting to rant a little bit. So 
we're a Highline car company now. I don't, it happened, man. I mean, I remember when our cars were all under $10,000. But now our cars are expensive. Our used vehicles are over $40,000. So I don't care what you think. Toyota now has become a Highline car manufacturer. And some of us need to start acting like we sell Highline cars. So anyway, I join a civic organization. I pick it. I select it. Lions Club, Optimus, Toastmaster, um, a Special Olympics, something like that. Go to every chamber of commerce meeting in town. They're very short. And then from the 150 members in here, so there's 150 members in this club, and they're hand selected by me. It's a club that has, I don't know, it's it's something they do that I believe in. Maybe it's charities for children. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's money and benefits for the handicap. I don't know. You just choose your own thing so that you enjoy the club. And let's say that 10% of the of the club members are going to buy a car within that year. Now, that doesn't include their spouses. That doesn't include their siblings. That's just the people that attend the meetings. So at 10%, that gives me an extra 15 car deals uh, a year that I really don't have to work for. All you got to do is do the paperwork, put it together, and have the car ready for delivery. So, and, and then again, you, you know, you get a little benefit out of this. I mean, you're, you're getting to give back to your community, um, give back to a charity. It kind of grows your heart a little bit. It's not a bad thing to do. The next thing is service drive. And I can't get people to work the service drive. Everybody wants to go back there and talk to somebody that's getting an oil change about buying a car. And I'm talking, when you really work the service drive, it's investment of your time. Think about it from 7 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock in the morning. There's not a whole lot of cars sold. There really is not a whole lot of cars sold. If you go to the dealership and you sit down, you can get your day organized, but there's no revenue generating hours that usually happen in the morning during the weekdays. But the service drive is hammered. So I used to go back there and serve coffee to the customers, and I'd stand back, I'd porter the car, I'd tell them a joke, I'd introduce myself. <clears throat> it, the best way to describe this is I became a politician. I was trying to get elected. I wanted to be elected the next person they bought a car from. And so my job in the first year that I worked in the dealership was to meet every single customer that came in that service drive and hopefully remember their first name. But because they only had to know me, then they go, hey, KC, I go, hey, hey, what you doing? And if I didn't remember their name, at least they remembered my name. And then magically over time, they would show up on a weekend or a Friday and they'd come up and go, hey, KC, I want to get a car for my daughter. I'd be back there in the back and I would help out the service riders. Because there's times that they're so busy that they can't really get to the customers. We hand wrote the ROs back then, so I could go start an RO, get all the information. Nowadays, I can go back and get all the information. I can walk it up to the ASM and go, this is Mr. Johnson. Here's all of this information, and here's what he's wanting to do today. So I'm speeding up the process for the ASMs. Believe it or not, the loudspeaker in the dealership started going, Casey, come to service, please. Casey, come to service. I'm up front, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Somebody tells one of the service riders that they're really looking for a second car for the family. All of a sudden, I got paged. Why would they page me? Because it, it was reciprocal, reciprocity. I gave to them. They gave back to me. It took some time. This didn't happen the first day. I didn't go back there demanding anything. I earned my spot, and I earned their respect for the time and labor that I put in. A rainy afternoon when nobody's coming in the dealership, when people are trying to get in their cars, I would, I would go out in the rain, bring their cars in so they wouldn't get wet. I would go over the RO with them, and I would give them my business card, and I said, you know, if you guys ever need anything, let me know. So I looked at it this way. Service drive, I try to talk to 10 people a day. Let's say the average salesperson works 250 days a year. I know, I know some of you think, 250, man, that'd be a lot of time off. I know. But 250, that's 2,500 people that you would talk to in the year. These 2,500 people own Toyotas. These 2,500 people know where your dealership is. These 2,500 people like your service department or they wouldn't be coming to your service department. These 2,500 people have cars that I know I can find a buyer for. So, I mean, don't, don't, don't let me get wrong here. At 1%, that's an extra 25 car deals a month. If I'm only selling 15, 16, 17 cars a month, that's almost two months worth of revenue right there. So I don't have a 12-month year anymore. I got a 14-month year. You guys can do the math. And then the last thing, I sold 200 people. This is the last thing for today. 100 of them were married or living together, but they had a partner, spouse, whatever you want to call it. A live-in boyfriend, girlfriend. Out of that 100... People have kids, 2.4 kids per household. 
Depends on where you live in the country. So I sold 200 cars to the husband or wife, boyfriend or girlfriend, partner, it doesn't matter. The other person in the relationship, the other adult, didn't buy a car from me. So why wouldn't that over time be the next thing I talk to? While I'm waiting for the business office, why wouldn't I talk to the husband about what they're going to buy next since the wife is now getting an Avalon? Find out a time, find out when they're wanting to do it, find out what their trade is. Put that in my computer system so that I can get ahead of them. Three months before they're ready to buy, I call up and say, hey, I know I'm three months early. But, but this, is, this is all generating work for the future so that you don't have to wait until every month comes and wait to see what the month gives you. Control your month. So I, I did this. That's 300 people right there. And so I said 300 at 10%. You, you can't retain 10% of these people's immediate family. And at 10% of their immediate family, once this starts rolling, that's an extra 30 cars a month. If you're a 15-car a month person, you just added two months to the calendar. And the last thing is body shop. And I went, man, body shop worked for me. Now, it took some effort, but body shop worked for me. W what kind of money are we making on a car when the insurance adjuster, adjuster comes in and says, that car's total lost? It's a total loss. Don't do any work on it. Don't do any bondo. Don't replace any body panels. We'll pick it up. We're going to take it to the salvage yard because it's a total. Body shop makes nothing but storage. Why wouldn't the body shop manager pick the phone up and go, hey, KC, I've got a three-year-old Avalon right here. It looks like the telephone pole is not going to come out of the car. It's a permanent part of the car. You might want to come back here. I'll give you the information. Let's call that customer up and make sure they're taken care of. And hopefully they lease the car and they have gap. They can just come in and get another car today. So, I mean, look how conservative I am. I said we got one of those leads a month. I don't know. Why don't you ask your body shop manager how many cars are totaled a month that go through the shop? Most of you watching this video have never thought about that, so you have no idea. But one a month is another 12 a year, because there's no way you're not going to sell those people a car. You can call the insurance company. You can send the insurance company an adjusted value. A lot of times you can get the customer more money than the initial offer from the insurance company because you have the actual facts about what that car they're going to replace it with will actually sell for in the open market full retail. Say that again. That's a full replacement check retail deal. That's not a negotiated deal. That's a retail deal. And that's 12. So look how stupid this is. I sold 200 cars. I invested a year to work all this right here. And then I end up with an extra 242. So could I go from 200 cars one year to 442 cars the next year? Most of you looking at this say, you know, Casey, that's a stretch. You know, to go from 200 to almost 500 cars in one year? Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't have to have an extra 242. If I do 200 cars next year based upon the, in, the traffic that comes in the dealership, based upon what my dealer is willing to spend to give me my generated ups, and I take that down and only make it 100, out of all that opportunity that I showed you right there, that's a 300 car year. And a lot of these deals I'm talking about are sticker price deal, non-negotiated deals. So your gross level goes up. And then they're a better referral client. You'll get more referrals because you made it easier. And all of a sudden, it's a dynasty. Listen, I want to close by saying, there's a lot of you that have been struggling in this car business a long time. I know you're making a living. I know you're making a living. And I know how hard you're grinding. But if you'll just reach out when you go to one of these regional meetings or a launch, a ride and drive, a launch, and find a couple of salespeople out there that you know are working in another dealership and you know they're selling two, three, four hundred cars a year. Have breakfast with them. Sit down and have lunch with them if you're in the afternoon crew for the launch. And ask them, how the hell are you selling 400 cars a year? I barely have enough time to finish the month up at 15 to 20 cars a month. I mean, I use every minute of every month. And find out what they're doing. And find that pathway. Think about 2018 as your launch board to get away from the norm that everybody does in the car business and find your niche. <clears throat> it could be social clubs, organizations. It could be working a service drive if you have a great bubbly over-the-top personality. That, that's easy right there. could be something as simple as chasing down the body shop totals. It could be something as simple as just following up with your client base to make sure you sell their spouse or their partner a car. Just like always. I want you guys to be as successful as you possibly can. This has been PK52, the Saturday morning meeting.